Are we live? And we are live. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Homeroom School Night. My name is Fred Sasaki, and I am your co-host with Keita Cheney for tonight's show, Coping and Not Coping with COVID-19. And like I said, that is brought to you by Homeroom Chicago as part of our school night series. So um, it's not easy getting through a global pandemic. Uh, tonight, we are talking with three Chicagoans on how they are coping, staying afloat and addressing mental health during this tough time. Uh, they are Steph Fowler, Whitney Hill, and Don Shiana Moon, all of whom Kidra will introduce shortly. Uh, we'll also explore the structural inequalities in the city and beyond that make coping easier or harder for certain communities and how to make space for hope and joy while not losing sight of what's being lost. Uh, but first, what is Homeroom? Uh, Homeroom is a Chicago-based 501c3 not-for-profit that designs artistic projects and programs with two core values, conversation and collaboration. Also, compensation. Uh, Homeroom pays artists and curators for their time and talent. Uh, that's really important and something we'll talk about more later in the show. Um, just want to say something about working with homeroom. Homeroom is sort of an artistic playground, uh, more like recess on the school theme for artists and venues to experiment. Uh, homeroom highlights new hybrid and emerging works as a practice. Uh, speaking of which, look out for homeroom's forthcoming 10 by 10 2020 in collaboration with Chicago Composers Orchestra. Uh, so 10 by 10 is a commission of dual media pieces between 10 composers and 10 visual artists. Uh, the results are always stunning and really over the map. They basically take 10 visual artists, 10 composers, and they make something. Uh, it's a great and long running series that I really encourage you to check out. And now uh, I will turn to Kidra with a tip of my hat. Uh, she almost single handedly put this show together while I have been struggling to stay afloat as I know she has been too. Um, and with that, and much love and respect, Kidra Cheney. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time to stay in with us tonight um, for school night. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying this is a very different show, both topic and format wise, than we had expected to do for the school night series this year. Um, but Fred and I were really inspired to do this in part because we're both struggling right now. Um, it's a rough time and we wanted to make a space to talk about it and to be um, honest with other folks about kind of what we're going through and what, you know, what's been difficult for us and what's been easier for us. Um, this is an unprecedented moment for us. And I am, will totally admit that none of us have all of the answers, um, but we wanted to take a space to talk to different folks in Chicago about how we're all getting through this and also have some real talk about how some of us for various reasons, structural and, and whatever, who are not getting through this and won't be getting through this. Um, so with that, we wanted to start off the evening with an essay from Whitney Hill. Um, Whitney Hill is the founder and director of SPORC, a nonprofit for people with cognitive, physical, and non-apparent differences. Whitney's vision is supported by her passion for advocacy and personal background of identifying as someone with a disability. Whitney also serves as an elected member of the Chicago Transit Authority's ADA Advisory Committee, and she is also a 2020 fellow for the ADA Advancing Leadership Institute. Um, and with that, here is Whitney Hill. Thank you so much, Kedra, and thank you everyone for having me here. I feel really honored and blessed to be here. Um, so I'm going to start off with reading an edited version of um, uh, an article that I, I wrote for my nonprofit, Spork. Um, it's called um, Digital Depression and Quarantine Faces. And so I have a little timer here. I'm gonna to try to get this exactly right because I wanna make sure I don't go too over. So uh, this is the beginning of, of the article. <clears throat> Each night at 8 p.m., 
When I go out to my Chicago studio apartment balcony, I yell into the sky. I yell as loud as I can to thank those who are actually protecting me and to hear my voice so that it can remind me that I'm still alive. After three minutes, my voice is hoarse. People stop shouting after around five minutes. My throat hurts, but I know it will stop once I go inside. The stabbing sting in my vocal cords will soon fade. Right now though, I yell. I well and scream. I'm alone in this apartment every second of every day, under lockdown, under threat and under fear. I'm forced to watch the swift action of this virus overtake the clouded inaction of this administration. My voice is ignored by everyone else and unused throughout the day, except right here at 8 p.m. I'm afraid of the future. Being inside, clocking in at four weeks now, actually going on nine, which has been a surprising experiment of isolation for me. All my introversion powers are being tested. Don't get me wrong, I isolate during the best of times because that's what makes me feel the best at heart. This staying inside, trapped with my rampant depression and anxiety, and cut off from all meditative avenues, feels like a beast turned in on itself. There are no museums to go to, parks to cycle through, or churches to pop into. No familiar faces to peer upon, odd idiosyncrasy of the mundane, or soft touches. And I have to be careful because any negative emotion I birth into my apartment now stays and lives with me within these walls. I breathe fire and try in vain to exhale feathers. I am a buoyant bomb. I feel I know that depression is something that people don't want to willingly talk about. Unlike most disabilities, as soon as I finally break down my walls and talk about my symptoms, I turn people away because suicidal ideation and self-harm are weighted balloons. If they're too heavy for me to consistently keep afloat, why not others? Plus, I really don't want involuntary to have to be a part of my vocabulary just because I'm admitting to my normal mental health reality. So I realize that when I'm going through a depressive episode, most conversations are constructed on my end to help ease and comfort others. I don't want anyone to feel sad, weird, or uncomfortable. So I listen intently to their concerns while biting my tongue about my own. I remind myself that most people like to only talk about themselves anyways and that I shouldn't be too upset. This should be expected. And when it is my turn to quietly quip about my difficulties, I grin and accept the broke ass cousin of empathy because sympathy is better than nothing, I guess. As long as I don't get judged or pitied. With a pandemic amongst us, it actually seems harder to validate any depressive episode because that old chestnut keeps thundering through my head. There are others who are worse off than me. Why should I be upset? This COVID-19, this has changed everything. Nothing will be the same. When I'm suffocating in my own presence in my apartment, 
I quietly gasped for clarity with these little Zoom calls, texts, and Netflix viewing parties. I see all these beautiful pixelated faces, all these souls that I'd rather experience in person, a luxury that I can't have. I patiently wait for them as their picture flickers on the screen and as the glitches finally sync their words with their mouth, I yearn for the familiar voice of those who know me best. It feels like most times my soul is trying to leap through the glass just to be with the ones I love. I feel foolish. Thank you guys. And if you want to read more, please go to um, Sports website www.sporkability.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Whitney. I'm so glad you read this. This was part of the reason why I was like, oh, I, I really want you on here. And I'm so glad that you agreed to read it. Um, so a couple questions for you, at least to start out with. Um, Full disclosure, both Whitney and I are um, ADA 25 Advancing Leadership Fellows, which is a fellowship for people with disabilities. Um, and we've talked about this um, personally, like in person um, and just outside of this, but um, this really spoke to me as somebody who um, lives with anxiety and depression. And so this feels very right or at least resonant for me. Um, but so much of what is talked about with uh, COVID-19 on a lot of levels when it comes to illness and disability well, and mental health in general, like we see certain framing about how uh, just across the board that puts people with illness, like it puts a value judgment on people with illnesses whether it's mental illness, whether it's whether you have the virus or not, like there, there's the people who get to stay well and are doing right. And then there are people who are doing wrong and like you've done something wrong to get ill. Um, and just in general, how do you feel the framing um, specifically for mental health, but just in general, how, how you feel the, the framing um, gets that wrong or, or what do you feel about how the the framing of that within um just the public eye um in media has been when it comes to illness you know it's been really it's been really interesting i i i i feel so conflicted for for a lot of different reasons i feel like for my loved ones and therapists who know me, for them, this has been hyper alert because they're, I, I feel like are they're on guard for my benefit. You know, they, they can't be here with me. They know that things are getting tough. And so I feel like they are, are for, for some of them, they're just really trying to, to really be present. And, um, and, you know, it's interesting because I feel like when you have, especially non-apparent, you know, disabilities, like, like, mental, like a lot of mental health, especially like depression, anxiety, you're used to all those symptoms being ignored. And so all of a sudden having a lot of loved ones being hypervigilant about it, like that's, it's, that's a new territory for, for me personally. And then um, it's also interesting because it's, for me, I keep thinking and, and and in part, I think really getting anxious for others who don't have a name or a label or a diagnosis for what they're feeling or going through. And this is the first time that they've hit this rock bottom and now they're experiencing all these symptoms for the first time. Um, Cause I know for me, the 2012, you know, recession, all of that was one of my big rock bottoms that forced me to go to depression, you, you know, to go to, I'm sorry, to therapy and to get the diagnosis that, you know, that I had major depressive disorder that, you know, to get the A to the B to the C to the Z. And, um, and that's a difficult road to go down. And I really do 
I, I feel like I was blessed to have a lot of, to have a support system to help guide me through that. Um, to help, and, and I really do kind of get anxious for people who are in brand new territory, who, um, who are feeling that they are becoming very depressed for the, for the first, second, umpteenth time, but now they really need resources, but they don't have it. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 my, my anxieties with, with what's going on right now with, with just mental health, especially just goes all over the place. Um, I really want people to get the resources that they, that they need. <clears throat> Whitney, can you tell us uh, a bit more about Spork and uh, how it's supporting people with invisible disabilities and just about what you do in general? Yeah, I'll be more than happy to. Um, so um, Spork is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit for people um, who are a part, the, a part of the disabled community in one way or the other. Um, and we really try to advocate the voices and the lived experiences of the people within the community, um, because I feel like that is so valuable. Um, if rather you acquired your disability or you are, have come across your disability through, you know, accident or illness or whatever, I feel like there's always going to be for someone a lot of fresh ground of what it's going to be like. And even if you lived it for years, you're not always going to have a support system that's going to understand what you're going through. And so sport really tries to highlight those stories. We advocate and try to get people to write about their experiences. So that that others can read about it and you know find solidarity. We really try to just give um, as big of a soapbox as we possibly can for the disabled community um, to just really talk about what they're going through. Um, and we do it. Um, we're, you know, we make it, we try to make everything accessible. Um, we don't own any of the submissions that come in. We really try to give full ownership and rights you know, to the writer, um, we just really want to just try to get the, the voice out. Um, and then side part, we um, occasionally, occasionally do video projects where we help highlight organizations and other businesses that, that help support uh, the disabled community. Um. There's a question that we'll be asking everybody tonight, but are there any um, mutual aid or support uh, projects or just something in general related to COVID-19 that you might want to lift up or call attention to or um, just shout out that you think might be important for people to know about? Yeah, you know, I think, um, just overall, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to um, going through this quarantine and just whatever what's going to come up by yourself in isolation, I, I just want to make sure that that stays in um, conversation, you know, because I think that um, I every everyone is going through such a, a such a tough time, and I just. I would just really hate for just any part of our community to get overlooked because they don't necessarily have the platform or voice to, to speak for themselves. Cool. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Um, I also just wanted to throw yeah. in there real quick that um, I spent some time on your website uh, just looking at it and I was, uh, really interested or very comforted by the the scroll of images that you have you have a lot of uh, artwork up and it was comforting in a very different way because uh the artwork well one it was uh recognizing me but then i felt like it was recognizing uh the turmoil that we experience inside so it was comforting in in this way uh and i also read that you um you're an artist and you uh have your BFA, and I was just curious, what, 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 what did you study or what do you do? 
Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for asking that. I, um, cause I, so I went to the school of the Institute of Chicago, um, SAIC here. Um, and I love always being able to, to talk about and show appreciation towards, um, towards my college. Cause I feel like they really helped me find my voice, not only within who I wanted to be as an artist, but transformative, how I wanted to, um, help others and that launched me into this whole other area of helping people with disabilities um, my when I went there my background is um, product design and I was really interested in designing tools and devices for people with disabilities and at the time when I was going to college there um, they had a, there were some of the few colleges, um, art colleges that really had a few classes that focused on that. And so, um, you know, I just, I, I, I feel like it's all together so important for people to be able to express themselves. You know, I think that's where healing comes in and goes out, like from beginning, middle and end. And I feel like when someone does not have the ability in any format that it is, if it's, you know, painting, if it's, you know, dancing, if it's writing, if, if it's music, if it's singing, whatever it is, if I feel like if people don't have that outlet, then um, that really does stifle a big part of their um, progress, you know, and, and I feel like especially when it comes to having a disability, you know, the arts is one of those few communities that just really accepts you for who you are and as you are. And only thing it really asks you to do is just, you know, kind of to live in your truth, you know, like as people say. So I, so I, I feel incredibly um, bonded with the art community and how it intersects with the disabled community. Um, I just have a lot of appreciation because for me personally, I would not be here if it was not for um, the art community giving me that like guiding arm that this is how I could help people. Very cool. Well, Thank you so much. That was a really beautiful essay and um, I loved hearing your answers. Um, shall we move on, Kitra? Yeah. Um, hi, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, you know, experiencing that disconnect um, that we're speaking of. <laughs> but I really oh, am here um, and, <laughs> and you guys are too. <laughs> and some other, and some other people I'm trusting are there too. Uh, so uh, our next guest is Don Shiana Moon. Uh, Don Shiana Moon is the founder director of Rax Geek, a belly dance and fire performance company that's been featured on MSN, UK Channel 4 TV, WGN TV, and more. She was just named best stage performer and best dancer by the Chicago Reader, as well as best singer songwriter, runner up, and best world music act finalist. As a musician, she's performed in 10 states. Her music is a blend of folk pop with influences from jazz and traditional Chinese music. Awesome, thanks for coming, Don. Um, we're super excited to have you here. Um, so you've been super vocal and open and really, um, You've really talked at length online in various places about some of the challenges of this moment for folks, um, especially while heading up Rack Geek and doing uh, performance work, um, just the struggles of moving to virtual, um, what it means for like lost wages. Um, and I would really love it if you could share some of those thoughts that you have today about how artists, performers, um, gig workers are really coping with this moment right now um, and, and kind of how, how you're coping with it as well. Sure, um, it's been a lot. <laughs> so everything that I do relies on live performance. Um, so when you have, uh, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about when the beginning everything was kind of going down, it was, uh, really really difficult for us because the guidelines were changing so so very quickly it was a lot to keep up with 
So one, you know, a few hours, you would have a guideline that said 50 people can meet together and that would be fine. And then the guidelines a few hours later would say, you can have a group of 10 people, 50 people isn't safe anymore. And so having all of these changes come at you really, really quickly was a lot to keep up with, especially as someone who is the person who is responsible for saying the show is canceled, the show is not canceled. And can we safely bring people together in a theater? So I, at one point, had a music gig and uh, the recommendations for crowd size changed so quickly that I canceled the music gig half an hour before I was supposed to leave my apartment to go do it. <laughs> so that's where we were sort of starting from as, as live performers, kind of immediately overnight, all of our gigs that uh, you're doing corporate gigs that pay a lot of money, all of those got canceled pretty much overnight. Um, all of our, our theater shows, uh, a lot of theaters in Chicago rely on people actually being physically there because a lot of them make their money off of bar sales. And so that's not something that translates very easily online. And it's not something that works very well to have people come through and you know pick up, um, pick up orders because they're really relying on physical bodies being a space.